uh, Ron Devor from uh, Texas A&M University, uh, Greg Buzzard from Purdue, and Rachel Ward from uh, uh, UT Austin. <clears throat> so, the first speaker is Ron Devor, who is a professor of mathematics at Texas A&M. He is one of the leading figures in nonlinear approximation, which in my opinion is a fundamental building block in the mathematical theory of learning. In fact, for myself, uh, when I hear the words nonlinear approximation, the name that comes to mind is actually that of uh, Ron Devor. So Professor Devor works is recognized worldwide he has held numerous visiting positions and has received numerous awards. Among the ones that I want to mention here, there are very few that I'll mention, are member of the National Academy of Sciences, foreign member of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, recipient of the gold medal of the Paris Foundation for Mathematical Sciences, and pl plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics. He is also a fellow of SIAM and a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. And he has many, many more awards, which I don't have time to list here. So Ron, please go ahead and start uh, with your talk. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let me give a shout out to the organizers. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful workshop so far. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, approximation uh, by neural networks. I'm going to concentrate on ReLU networks. Uh, I don't think we need to advertise too much why approximation is important. It's the backbone of all the numerical algorithms and learning and all the applications of neural networks. Uh, here's an overview of the talk. You can uh, read it. Uh, I hope I have enough time to go through everything. Uh, so ReLU, let me set the notation that I'm going to use. So I'm gonna look at uh, ReLU networks which have a width W and a depth L. So I denote the output of such networks, that is the functions that are created by such networks by this upsilon WL. And so ReLU's deactivation, the function can be a function of D variables. And uh, I'm going to assume a scalar output if it's, if it's a vector output, you handle it component wise. So I think people are uh, familiar with, with ReLU. Uh, I don't think I have to say too much about it. You take your input uh, vector X, which is an RD in this schematic, it's R2. You push it through the network going from layer to layer and till you get to the final layer and then you output a linear combination of the functions uh, at, uh, held at this uh, final layer uh, plus an offset B. Uh, okay, so what, it, what, what are these uh, guys, uh, these functions that are in Upsilon WL? Oh, that's going to be the first part of my talk. Well, the first thing to realize is once you've set this architecture as I have to be uh, W and L, that uh, all that's left is to set the parameters alpha, that is the weights and biases in the network. And when you prescribe uh, one set of parameters alpha, you get an output, which is a function. I denoted by S alpha here. And uh, the number of parameters, I, I, uh, we, know, we know exactly how many parameters are, are used. And the important thing is uh, I'm gonna look at uh, two special cases uh, typically of uh, ReLU. One is where the, uh, number of hidden layers is one. So the second term here wouldn't appear and the, the number of parameters would grow like W, the width. The other case is when W is fixed, some fixed number, typically a number depending on D and then L 
uh, grows. And again, the number of parameters grows like a constant uh, times n. So these outputs, they uh, describe a manifold of functions, a nonlinear manifold. So the set that we're using to approximate, we, in approximation theory, we call this our approximation tool. Uh, this is a nonlinear uh, manifold in contrast to a lot of approximation, which is to take a linear space of a fixed dimension to do the approximation. So now we're taking a nonlinear manifold in place of a linear space and the number of parameters n is akin to the dimension n you would have in a linear case. Okay, so this is a form of approximation which we call manifold uh, approximation in, the, in approximation theory. So I wanna talk a little bit about the structure of this uh, space. That is, what are the objects that we get? We get functions, what kind of functions do we get? And uh, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, we can say some things. Uh, first of all, every output is a continuous piecewise linear function. What do I mean by that? I mean, you take your domain RD or some subset of RD, let's say all of RD, and you partition it into cells and each cell is a convex polytope. And the function S you get is uh, subordinate to uh, such a partition P. Now in the case of uh, upsilon WL, if you look at the number of cells you can get in such a partition, uh, it can be huge. It, can, it grows like uh, W to the DL. So if you, even if you fix uh, W and, and D, it's growing exponentially with L. So at first glance, if you're an approximation guy, you say, wow, I mean, I have a tremendously uh, big uh, set of functions, uh, all these partitions, and I have an anisotropy in the partitions. I can make, you know, small cells, big cells, uh, all kinds of geometry. Uh, so I must have a very uh, powerful approximation tool. But uh, the first uh, very important comment to make here is that you don't get all CPWL functions on uh, such partitions. That is, if you fix W and L and you look at a partition that you get in one of the piecewise linear guys you get on this partition, suppose you say, oh, I like the partition really well, but I don't like the particular piecewise linear guy I got. I wanna retain this partition and change the piecewise linear guy. Well, you can't do that. <clears throat> the partition and the piecewise linear guy you get are tied together. And this is uh, due to uh, linear dependence between the uh, affine or linear pieces on, on each cell. Uh, so let me uh, try to give a little bit more feeling for what uh, these outputs look like. Let's look at the case when we take one hidden layer. So in the case of one hidden layer, every output looks like a linear combination of these functions Li. Each Li is an affine function and then ReLU is applied to it. So this, this function here, Li will be, will have uh, two pieces, one piece that will be linear and the other piece that will be zero. And the pieces are de decided by a hyperplane where uh, the affine function is uh, equal to zero. So this sort of divides the space RD into two parts. And on one part you have linear, on the other part you have uh, zero. Uh, so here's an example, D equals two, two dimensions. And now the affine, uh, the, the hyperplanes will be lines. And so you have uh, W lines, right? If I'm uh, one layer and uh, with W, I'll have W lines and the partition will be a partition uh, looking something like this. So the number of cells again could be humongous even with uh, uh, one layer. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some important things about uh, this uh, space uh, with one uh, hidden layer. 
So if you were in one dimensions, uh, everything is quite simple in the sense that what you get is a piecewise linear function on a partition into W plus one uh, intervals. We say this is a piecewise linear with W breakpoints. And basically you get all those uh, functions. So this is a well studied area in approximation theory we know uh, probably all that will ever be known about uh, this, and I'll touch upon this a little bit later. Uh, when we go to D bigger than one, that is the higher uh, space dimension, uh, I already mentioned you don't get all uh, CPWL fu uh, functions on a given uh, partition that you generate. Uh, for example, to see why this is the case, let me mention two uh, things. First of all, there are no compactly supported functions in this space when D is bigger than or equal to two. Well, that's a big handicap because you know, in approximation, we like to do things locally. We like to look at our function and where, where it's uh, rough, uh, uh, we, we, we do one thing and where it's uh, nice, we uh, do something else. Uh, so, uh, but you're not able to do this in the case of uh, one hidden layer because uh, there's not a locally supported basis like a, an FEM base or finite element nodal basis. Doesn't exist in these spaces. And this is a, a, a handicap in improving results. Okay. Uh, now, as L gets bigger than or equal to two, things begin to free up. This is great. This helps us. This is one of the reasons why we like deeper networks. For example, when L is two, now, now you do get compactly supported functions. And if you take L big enough, uh, let's see. I thought I mentioned somewhere here. If you take L bigger than log of uh, D plus one, D is your uh, number of variables, you, you get uh, finite element uh, nodal bases. And so you, you now have entered a domain which we're familiar with where we have good locally supported bases that we can uh, play with to, to build our uh, approximants. Okay, so again, uh, this space is a, uh, non-linear manifold. And the way we uh, look at this uh, space from the point of view of approximation theory is that if we prescribe uh, the parameters, right? W and L think of it as fixed now. And so what you have flexibility and is, is giving the weights and biases, uh, weights in, in the matrices and the biases in, in the offsets, then, uh, as you vary those, you, you, you describe this uh, manifold. And if you prescribe a parameter, then there's this mapping that takes the parameter, this mapping I denote by MN, it takes the parameter and maps you into this piecewise linear function. So this mapping MN, which given the parameter places you on the manifold, uh, this is not too bad of a mapping uh, it's continuous, it's actually locally Lipschitz, that's the good news. That is, if you vary parameters slightly, the outputs don't vary too much, uh, but the Lipschitz constant can be bad as uh, you increase the size of the parameters. Namely, if you looked at any fixed ball in RD, you would have a Lipschitz constant on that ball, but uh, if you took, for example, balls at the origin and started blowing them up, the Lipschitz constant will blow up likewise. Okay, so that's that manifold. And now what is an approximation scheme? An approximation scheme, what it is, is an assignment of parameters, right? You take your target function or the function you're trying to approximate, little f, and your job now is to say, okay, what parameters do I choose in the neural net to form the approximate, right? So you have this mapping, and this is an important mapping. We'll be discussing it as we go along. This mapping from uh, where your functions live, some Banach space, let's say LP space. So it takes F and maps it into N parameters and 
that uh, mapping of the note uh, by little a n, and then your approximant is capital A n of f, which is m n of little a n of f, and that lies in your neural net space sigma n. Sigma n is one of these upsilon WL spaces, and n indicates how many parameters you have. So this is what we mean by manifold approximation. You could think of this, you don't have to have the image of the manifold be these outputs of neural nets, these piecewise linear, it could be some other uh, possible method of uh, uh, manifold approximation. So a proper analysis of neural nets would be to compare it with other methods of manifold approximation, other manifolds, n-dimensional manifolds. This will be important as we go forward. Okay, one little slide on advantages of depth. We'll see, I mean, the, the, the meta theorem is that depth always beats width. Uh, if you're talking just about approximation, uh, depth helps you a lot. Some of the reasons are listed here on this slide. Uh, oh, here's where I say that you get finite element bases if you choose L just a little bit, you know, larger than or equal to log of uh, D plus one. You can capture the typical building blocks we use in approximation. You know, we usually we approximate by polynomials or piecewise polynomials or wavelet sums, Fourier sums, etc. All those building blocks can be captured with exponential accuracy, e to the minus c l, as you increase the depth l. That is, these guys are in your neural net space. So your neural net space, that output space is quite broad. It contains a lot of familiar building blocks. You can do things like max of uh, functions uh, very cheaply, and uh, you can output self-similar structures very uh, cheaply. And the important thing that was mentioned uh, often is Huawei Shen's talk is the fact that you can uh, compute uh, compositions of two functions cheaply. Namely, if you took uh, two functions that lived in this space, upsilon wl, and you wanted to compose them, it will be an upsilon w2l. Now, that's, uh, that's a great advantage because think, for example, about polynomials. If I took two polynomials, p and q, and I looked at p of q of x, if p and q had dimension m, the composition would have dimension m squared, not 2m. But here we get 2l. So this is similar to tensors, and this is a great advantage. Uh, the self-similar thing, I mean, the simplest example people pop up with is uh, if you begin with a hat function, uh, which is in uh, uh, upsilon uh, 2, 1, and then you compose it with itself n times, you get the sawtooth function, which has now two to the n, two to the n teeth, right? Two to the n hat functions, but you only needed n parameters to generate this. So this is in what would be a low uh, dimension uh, manifold because n is small, but you have two to the n pieces. <coughs> this is in contrast to uh, when we do uh, spline approximation, because if I wanted this function in a, spline space, I would need the dimension to be like two to the n, not n. So this is an, another sort of a, a precursor of why uh, depth is going to be uh, useful. All right, so now I want to start talking about uh, what do we know about approximation by these neural net spaces? And there are a lot of papers written, and uh, every day I get uh, become aware of uh, new papers. Uh, yesterday, last night, I got one from uh, Jonathan and, and Jin Chow. So, I mean, this happens every day. So uh, there's a lot of work uh, going on and uh, I can't speak about all of it. I, I limit myself. Uh, so uh, what we'll talk about what these papers address, but uh, what we'd like to address is why why is neural network approximation better than the traditional methods that we use in approximation theory? Splines, wavelets, 
sparse approximation and, and the like. So how, how would you, you know, if, if somebody came into your office and you had to say, hey, these neural nets are great, and you want to convince them that uh, they're great, from an approximation viewpoint, how would you do that? Well, uh, what we usually do, how we evaluate uh, a, an approximation method is we evaluate it on what we call model classes. Now, why model classes? If I take a function f, if you tell me nothing about f, I can't tell you anything about how well it's approximated by any method. To get information on how well it's approximated, I need properties of f. And so what we do is we create what we these model classes they take all the properties we know about f and we put all those properties together and that describes our model class k so the model class is really a succinct way of saying this is what we know about the target function f the typical model classes that you see used every day in numerical analysis and pdes uh, in uh, signal processing and so far are typically of the following type. They're either smoothness spaces, you know, the function has so many derivatives or their space is built on sparsity. This is prominent in, in uh, signal processing and compressed sensing and the likes, band limits and so on. So how do we evaluate a, a, a method of approximation? And here SIGMAN is not necessarily neural nets, it's any family that you're using to approximate. Uh, we take a, a, a norm in which we want to measure error. And in this talk, it's going to be exclusively an LP norm. But in general, it could be any monarch space norm. We say, OK, we want to approximate our target function in this uh, norm. And we know that the target function is in this uh, model class, K. And so we look at F and see how well we can approximate it in, by, by our approximation tool. And then we take the soup over all guys in the model class. So we're pessimistic. This is worst class error. You could think in terms of uh, using some uh, averaged error. And this may, in fact, be important when we're uh, dealing with learning. But in my talk, I'm going to stick with this worst, uh, worst error. So this is an error for the model class. And if we want to say that uh, an, uh, an approximation method like neural nets is better than other approximation methods, then what should we be able to say? We should be able to say, well, look at your classical model classes. My method beats all, all your methods on these classes. That's somewhat convincing, if you can make a statement like that. Another type of statement could be, well, yeah, maybe, you know, it doesn't beat all those, but I have these new model classes and where my method does so well on these new model classes and your method does not. And uh, this could be the reason why neural nets are good. Maybe there are some new model classes that we're not typically aware of where neural nets perform exceptionally well. And the mother of all ways to say that your method uh, is better than all the other methods uh, is this idea of approximation classes. So uh, if we take a rate of approximation, in this case, I just take polynomial rates, n to the minus r, r is a positive integer, let's say n to the minus two. And I look at all functions that are approximated by this rate uh, from my method of approximation, sigma right? This could be neural nets, could be polynomials, whatever you like. I look at all those functions. So these are the functions I know can be approximated with this rate and, and, and no better in some sense than this rate. If I can show that this class of functions for my method is big, bigger than for all other methods, then I have a, 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 a convincing argument that uh, my method is, is, is better than your method. OK, so uh, I, I want to emphasize with uh, one more sentence about this approximation class. Uh, you know, we search for good model classes. Uh, 
when we try to prove a theorem. This is a, a possible model class you can use uh, in proving uh, theorems. You may not know exactly what this model class is, but this could be a good vehicle for uh, establishing uh, theorems uh, where you want a quantitative estimate of, of uh, how your particular numerical method is performing. Okay, so let's now talk about what do we know about neural nets? How are they doing uh, in regard to this kind of an evaluation? So uh, I'm uh, going to talk, uh, so, so most of the papers, if you look at, uh, that are written on this subject, they deal with approximation in LP or in some Sobolev norm. And they use as model classes, typically smoothness classes, which are Helder's, Sobolev, Bessoff classes. And they prove a quantitative theorem about the rate of approximation of such a model class in the LP norm. So let's think uh, in, in, uh, for, for the moment about Sobolev classes. So what are Sobolev classes? They, they're, they're functions that have S derivatives. So S, the smoothness, is the number of derivatives the function has. And the derivatives are bounded in some L tau norm. So I use tau different than P. This is important because I'm doing the approximation in LP but I'm measuring the smoothness in L tau. So the, met, the, the uh, model classes I'm gonna look at are these unit ball of WS L tau, S derivatives in L tau. Now, if you look at what, what are the typical results in approximation theory for other methods, they typically take the form that the, you can approximate such a function in this model class to an accuracy n to the minus s over d. These are the best methods, the nonlinear. You need nonlinearity to get this kind of a rate. And so the smoothness enters here, the dimension d enters here. This is a curse of dimensionality. The bigger d is, the smoothness helps you less. And then there's this big constant cd in front. Now I wanna give a graphic to interpret this because uh, we're gonna reflect back on this uh, a few times. So here's a graphic that is uh, meant that er uh, uh, you look at points in the upper quadrant in, in two dimensions and every point has two coordinates, uh, first coordinate and the second coordinate. The, the second coordinate of this point, I'm gonna think of this point as associated to one of these smoothness spaces. The second coordinate, the y, tells me the amount of smoothness. Uh, so um, this point is gonna be identified with a smoothness space ws, a Sobolev space ws l tau. So the y tells you the s and the x value tells you the tau, but it does so not tau, but by one over tau. And this is because of Reese, uh, uh, Reese to find the LP space is wrong. They should have used one over P instead of P as the index. Okay, so what does the Sobolev embedding theorem say? It says there's this line here written in the equation drawn here. In D dimensions, this line gets steeper. Everything to the left of this line, every space that has a point uh, of this form to the left of the line is compactly embedded into LP. Any point outside here that's not in the shaded region is not, e the, it's not even embedded in LP. And then things on the line, well, there, it's a little subtle uh, to decide whether it, that space is uh, compactly embedded in the LP or, or not. So this is a, a, a graphic of the Sobolev embedding theorem. And the theorem I told you before was that uh, if you have a good nonlinear method of approximation, then if for any point here at level S, you'll get the rate of approximation N to the minus S divided by D. You can push to this point all the way to the Sobolev embedding line. Frequently you see theorems that say, well, if the function has S derivatives in LP, the same P value that I'm doing the approximation, then I get N to the minus S over D. This is a lot easier to prove, can be proved by linear methods. 
Uh, this is not too deep. But if you want to prove the results for all the spaces that embed, you need nonlinear methods. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about one hidden layer. You know, it's, it's very embarrassing that we do not know the answer as to what are the approximation rates for all sobolev balls. So here, KST denotes one of these, KS tau, one of these unit balls of Sobolev spaces. And the first question you'd like to answer is, well, if I use as my approximation tool neural nets with one hidden layer and I let the width grow by denoting W by N here, what's the rate of approximation? Well, we don't know the answer to that question. That's quite embarrassing. And the reason why we don't know the answer, by the way, is this problem we had that we don't have a compactly supported function. There are a couple cases where we know what's going on. If we do the approximation in L infinity, then we know that the uh, rate of approximation saved for a logarithm uh, we know that an upper bound is n to the minus s divided by d. And there is, in fact, a corresponding lower bound. Doesn't quite match because of logarithms. And the lower bound is given by VC dimension. And so that really the rate of approximation, if you approximate an L infinity, and you use as your smoothness that the function should have s derivatives, in L infinity, not in a, some L tau, but in L infinity, uh, this will be the rate. There are no statements about what happens when you take uh, smoothness in L tau. And yet you should, because as I mentioned, this is a nonlinear space, this uh, sigma n. And if we compare it to other nonlinear spaces, for other nonlinear spaces, we can put tau here instead of infinity and get this rate. So this is missing. There are also results in L2. I skip over them here. You can look at the slide later to see what they are. <clears throat> Let's go to deeper networks because this is the interesting part. So let's suppose we, we look at a fixed width. Uh, you could take, for example, something like uh, 2D or 2D plus five or something for the, the width. So you fix it, it only depends on the number of variable d. And now you let the depth grow, n. And so let's look at that class, uh, sigma n, these neural nets to do the approximation. What can we say in this case about approximation of these classical smoothness classes? Well, all of a sudden life becomes better because I can prove that for every, con every uh, s and tau, such that this unit ball compactly embeds into LP, that I get this rate that we, we had for other methods. So here I'm saying that for every uh, smoothness class that is in the shaded region, I get the rate of approximation n to the minus s over d, where s is the smoothness. So I can push as close as I want to the Sobolev embedding line. This is save for some logarithms, by the way. And so in this sense, you could say, well, hey guys, the neural nets do as well as any of your methods, because for these spaces, I get exactly uh, what you get. But life is even better. And the better part is something I wanna spend some time on. The better part is that there is some super convergence. And these go back to uh, results of uh, Dmitry Yarotsky and, and uh, Zuawi Shen and his uh, collaborators. I hope I have the right paper here uh, listed here. And here's an example of uh, what they prove. They say, let's look at the unit ball of uh, WS in L infinity now. We're going to do the approximation in L infinity. I could put here L infinity instead of C. We're going to do the approximation in L infinity, and we're measuring smoothness in L infinity. So back here, we're, we're, we're doing the approximation here, whoops, uh, in L infinity, which is the point zero, zero. And we're measuring smoothness on this vertical line. So we're, the smoothness space, the dot here, is at this uh, 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 zero 
S. So we're not talking about going all the way across here. We're just taking smoothness of order S in L infinity. But the, the great thing is that we get a, a rate of approximation n to the minus 2s divided by d, double the rate we get for all other methods. Well, you see this, and uh, if you're somebody in approximation theory or numerical analysis, you're a little bit stunned, and you sort of say, well, how the heck are they doing that? You know, how do they, how do they get this double rate? Isn't that somehow outstanding? Maybe this is the answer. Maybe this is the explanation of why neural nets are so great. Well. Although I like uh, uh, these people, Huawei and uh, Dimitri very well, I, I want to throw some cold water on, on the result. Uh, before I do that, I want to mention that you can actually bootstrap their result together with results uh, on interpolation uh, of operators. And you can prove superconvergence uh, it, in a very general sense, you can measure error in LP rather than L infinity. Remember the result I quoted is do error in L infinity and smoothness in L infinity. I say now you can take any LP, measure error in LP, measure smoothness in some L tau where tau uh, can go the full range and you'll get a super convergence result on this uh, broken line, this horizontal line and the way you do it is because you've got a super rate here you have an ordinary rate here but when you do interpolation you inherit some of this uh, the super rate uh, every everywhere here so the super rate will deteriorate as you approach the boundary of the uh, Sobolev embedding but uh, you still get a super rate Okay, so you see this result and you say, wow, it's great. And, and, and now you want to say, why is this happening? Why are we getting this super rate? So I want to go back to the idea that we're using parametric manifolds to do the approximation. And uh, so, you know, a right uh, comparison of neural networks would be say, well, let's compare it to other uh, approximation by other parametric manifolds. Well, First thing I can say is that given any compact set K in LP, I don't care what it is, it doesn't have to be a Sobolev or Bessoff space. I can find a one dimensional manifold that fills K, right? I mean, you can just uh, take a dense set of points and start connecting them, finite set, set of points, and start connecting them with linear segments. And you'll get a one dimensional manifold that will approximate to any accuracy you want. So in this sense, I don't need your n. I don't need your depth n. I can do it with a one-dimensional manifold. I can get whatever rate you got, I can get with a one-dimensional manifold. So in that sense, it says, well, maybe you're not so doing so great. So to me, what the superconvergence is saying is that the neural net space of dimension n, this space, has some space filling that, that, that's going out on. Now, would you use a one-dimensional manifold in approximation? The answer is no. Why? Because if you given the task of finding an approximation to F, you have to find a parameter theta that identifies a point on the manifold. And finding this uh, theta is like in, impossible. Right, it's like having a radio which can receive every radio station in the world, but if you wanna tune it to a given radio station, you can never do it because as you turn the dial, things are changing so fast, you'll never get to it. Okay, so if we want to really understand, uh, you know, so I say, wait, let's hold on a minute. This result on superconvergence is not so convincing because it is not really telling me there is a stable numerical method to do the job. So I want to formulate that. So now we have to go back to our mapping AN, which remember selected the parameters to do the approximation. And we talked about manifold approximation and I'm saying now, wait a minute, we have to put some conditions on AN. Why? Let's look at 
a, a model class and see how well we can approximate in three scenarios. One is we'll put no conditions on AN. Another is we'll assume AN is continuous. So that the selection that as I change F, move it to a G nearby, I don't change the parameters very much, which one dimensional manifold will not allow you that opportunity. And, and the third example is to assume that AN is Lipschitz. That matches what we usually talk about as stability in numerical analysis. If I take these three different scenarios, here are three theorems. First of all, for the, the one about space filling I already mentioned, take any uh, set K and the, you will be able to get as close to zero as you want with a one dimensional manifold. Second theorem, whoops. Uh, the second theorem says, if you look at these classical smoothness spaces, if you require that your selection, that AN, AN this selection of the point on the manifold is just continuous, you won't get better than the standard rate n to the minus s over d. So you won't get this super rate. You won't get n to the minus 2s over d. And more generally, for any compact set, if you start to require that these mappings are Lipschitz, you'll never do better than the entropy of the set k. So entropy enters, and it's important. And what is entropy? Uh, if you take a set k, uh, the entropy number of k is to epsilon n of k says, OK, I, I, I want you, I'll give you a budget of 2 to the n balls to cover k and see how small you can make those balls. So you have a budget of 2 to the n balls, and you say, how small can I make the radius and still cover k? That's called the entropy number of K. It measures how nice K is, how smooth it is. And that entropy number I claim is something you're not going to ever do better in approximation with nonlinear N parameters, everything you want. You'll never do better than the entropy number epsilon N of K uh, with a stable numerical method. That's the bottom line here. Okay. So you, 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 you may say, look, I listen to that DeVore guy, he's going on and on entropy, this, that, I don't care about entropy, I don't care about stability. Well, you should at least care about this. It, in your numerical method, if you're going to try to approximate or learn, you should care about how much computational time you're going to take to find the approximation. Another way to view what I just said was, look, measure not the approximation method, not only by how well it can approximate, but how much time does it take you to find the approximate? If you're searching over this manifold, if I make the manifold very complex and space filling, it takes me forever to find a good parameter. So I claim you really need to evaluate numerical methods and learning uh, with the idea in mind of how many computations did it take you to do the task. Okay, I have uh, still a few minutes, great, because I want to say a few things about high dimensions. So, you know, I spent all this time, I'm sorry, uh, discussing classical smoothness and what we know, but uh, to a person in learning, if I, if I started presenting these results, a person in learning, he would immediately cut me off and say, this is completely useless because the, the functions we're trying to learn are very high dimensional. They're functions of D variables and D is super large. So all these classical model classes you spent your time discussing uh, don't fit what we're doing because they all suffer the curse of dimensionality. You'll never be able, I mean, you have this constant CD in front. You can show they have bad entropy. You'll never be able to handle them when D is large. This statement is often called the curse of dimensionality. And the, the term curse of dimensionality is used so often that it forces me to say a few words about it because I think it's some, sometimes used in the wrong way. So frequently you, you, you see a paper I use neural nets and I voided the curse of dimensionality. Well, 
let's clarify this. So when you're talking about a numerical method and you want to evaluate it, you need a model class. And it's the model class is that is going to decide to you whether you whether or not you can beat the curse of dimensionality. That is, the entropy of this class K is going to decide whether or not there is possible numerical method that will perform at a, a, a good rate without suffering the curse of dimensionality. So it's the model class, not so much the method yet. However, once you establish that the entropy is okay, and so that it's possible to have a numerical method that can you know, defeat the curse of dimensionality, now your job is to find the numerical method. And that's where a result which says, well, neural nets do that job, then yes, you can say they did break the curse of dimensionality for this set K, but you can't, you know, it depended on you having a good K, right? All right, so, uh, you know, where, where does uh, neural network theory uh, lie here if we want to understand uh, why neural nets are, are powerful in learning? Uh, we have to tackle the question of how do they do in high dimension? And what we need is we need model classes for our intended application. So this is what I think is still lacking in uh, approximation and learning in high dimensions is what are the model classes K that we should use to describe the functions we're trying to learn? So we're in high dimension and these model classes K, first of all, they should match the application, right? I mean, they shouldn't be something crazy that <clears throat> if you're talking about signals, if you have band limits or a Fourier limit, you know, limits on Fourier transform, that makes sense. So depending on the application, you should have limits. I mean, you should have uh, the model class reflect uh, th that application. As I mentioned, you want the model class to avoid a curse of dimensionality. That means we want the entropy of this class to be uh, reasonable. And then we need to show that the neural nets perform well on these model classes. Now, do we know such things? Well, we know some things, but unfortunately the theory is not uh, cohesive enough yet. So we know things like sparsity as a possible uh, assumption to define a model class in high dimensions. Zhuawei Shen talked about this in his talk, uh, sparsity with respect to basis dictionary or frame. We have the barren class. This is actually of this form. It's a sparse, it's sparse in, in a dictionary representation. We have the fact uh, that composition is easy to perform with neural nets. There are classes of functions built on the idea of composition. This is, was in Zwawi's uh, talk and Tommy Poggio has a survey article on this. Self-similarity I measured. There are now appearing uh, papers that show that certain classes of fractal-like uh, self-similar functions, dynamical systems, uh, model classes built on those ideas work in high dimension. Anisotropy. This means that not all variables are equally important. There's not democracy in variables. And then uh, finally, uh, low dimensional manifolds. A lot of uh, uh, talks in uh, this uh, conference engage low dimensional manifolds. So if you wanna to contribute to uh, high dimension, try to find the right uh, model classes and show that uh, neural nets uh, beat curse and dimensionality for those model classes. I'll close with this and I thank the Chair for letting me go over by a few minutes. I forewarned him. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so Jonathan, are there any questions in the pipeline? Um, there, is a, there is a comment. Um, it's just a small comment on the super convergence results of Yurotsky maybe a slightly different perspective. By the way, he also has results on sine ReLU networks with exponential convergence for Sobolev functions in any dimension. However, first, as you mentioned, 
the approximation procedure, i.e. the parameter selection map, is necessarily discontinuous. Yartsky also emphasizes that. Second, these type of approximations require a higher precision of encoding the weights, i.e. compared to continuous approximation methods. The weights of the network require twice the number of digits for the same precision epsilon. In other words, the complexity of your approximation is the same as with continuous methods. It's just hidden in the length of the weight encoding rather than the number of weights, which I, I think, yeah, that comment um, is closely related to, to what, what, um, what you said about the, the entropy of this class of functions that you're approximating. Um, if, if it has the entropy, there have to, have to be some tricks. Let me comment on that. It's also to do with what I mentioned about a one-dimensional manifold. You can have a one-dimensional manifold, right? And what happens with a, a, a one-parameter manifold, as you change the parameter, you move in the uh, space X uh, very fast. So if you want to uh, describe the parameter that will correspond to your approximation, you have to describe it with very high accuracy. That's its idea of this commenter about uh, the bit, the number of bits you need to describe that uh, particular uh, 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 parameter as being huge. You need to have the, the uh, accuracy of the uh, weights and biases uh, tremendously high accuracy. So yeah, I mean, I know this, uh, what, what the comments made. Uh, I knew that stuff, but uh, I think that's a useful comment. Yeah. Were, were there more? Yeah, uh, yeah maybe I can, uh, are there more, Jonathan? Uh, there's one more question that just came in. It says, uh, can you please explain how entropy depends on the curse of dimensionality? Um, yeah, so entropy is a condition you put on your model class that, and you can think of it as encoding, it's true. It really, the Kolmogorov entropy was introduced for the purposes of giving a mathematical theory for encoding that uh, was the deterministic analog of Shannon's entropy. So there, the, the question is how many bits would you need to encode the functions in, in your class K uh, with a given accuracy. And then you can show, the well, it's equivalent to how many balls of radius, if you want to encode to accuracy epsilon, then how many balls of radius epsilon do you need to cover K, all right? And, and uh, so it's connected to uh, 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 encoding. Now, when we're looking at a class, uh, uh, a model class in high dimensions, uh, Typically, if I took a class like a smoothness class, its entropy is huge. As D increases, the entropy explodes, <laughs> right? So I need a lot of balls to cover this, uh, uh, for example, a Sobolev ball in high dimensions. I would, well, if I wanted to cover it with small balls, I'd need a lot of small balls uh, to cover it. So it has high entropy. This means that any numerical method, if you try to approximate functions, will suffer because of this high entropy. So I say what we need in uh, high dimensions is we need natural classes, model classes, whose entropy is not bad. Maybe it grows linearly with D or polynomially with D, uh, but doesn't grow exponentially with D. If we have such a class, then the dimensionality will not affect us uh, that greatly. It, on a theoretical level, we know before we begin that it's possible that we can do an approximation. We can encode, for example, the element. We know that. So we should be able to approximate. Then the job is to find what uh, approximation tool will do the job. And this is where neural nets may be very powerful. So I hope that answers that uh, question. Yeah, so I also have a related question. Uh, in some sense, uh, is there any quantitative uh, relation between the smoothness classes and their entropy? So do you know for all these Bessel space and the, what is their entropy? We, exactly, we know, we know the entropy. The entropy numbers, so what is the entropy number again? Epsilon n means I give you a budget of two to the n balls 
and you try to take the balls of radius epsilon and cover it. How small can you make epsilon? That's epsilon n. And the answer is that epsilon n is n to the minus s over d. <laughs> there it is. Okay. It's oh, at okay. n to the minus s over d. So uh, yeah, I, I, entropy, by the way, it's easier to compute entropy than anything else. Right. Uh, it's just a question of, of trying to find a cover or how far can functions be apart in your space, right? If you have two, if you have two functions and they're, uh, you know that their derivatives are less than one, uh, right? So this is like uh, lip one. How many functions can you place that are uh, distance epsilon apart? Well, you can place one over epsilon of them in one D uh, apart. So it's, it's kind of easy to see what the entropy of a class is or a lot easier than to, to do an approximation theorem or a, a method of approximation that achieves the approximation. But computing the entropy is not too hard, usually. And that's why I advocate that if you're searching for high dimensional model classes, uh, you could and should try to compute the entropy first. Because if the entropy is reasonable, then you can say, hey, I have a shot here because uh, I know I won't suffer the curse of dimensionality. For example, the Baron class, which is used all the time, uh, you can compute the entropy of that uh, class. That would actually tell you, uh, I, I don't know, Jin Chao, is somebody talking uh, about that at the- uh, Chao so will, will talk. We'll, uh, I, I just <laughs> want to- uh, but anyway, you, you can compute the entropy of that class and that'll tell you the optimal rate of approximation you can show the entropy with stable like methods, huh? <laughs> Jonathan, yeah. we, computed, we computed the entropy. Jonathan, compute the entropy of that class. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Right. <laughs> Not too hard because you get an upper bound because every function can be written as a sum. Uh, no, we, we, we computed it, actually. Oh, you did it. And, yeah. And we, uh, Jonathan will show you tonight. Uh, thanks. Uh, I just want to add a uh, round for this very nice uh, talk. I, uh, uh, quite a few things I didn't know before. I thought I read uh, most of your papers, but I thought they were good enough. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, the, uh, I'm just hoping that the paper I sent you last night, uh, which, uh, which Jonathan will talk this evening, hopefully will provide us an answer to some of your questions. And uh, I could be wrong, but. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I, I just have uh, one question which I fascinating to me, which I certainly, my very experience uh, pretty much verify you just said. It's just very difficult to achieve numerically this symptomatic rate we prove. We have not been able to do that yet. Now the question is that, uh, Ron, can you explain again, why do you have that insight that, that uh, it's just difficult to get that right? Uh, I don't quite follow your argument. Well, the argument is that uh, the entropy numbers of your class determine how well you're gonna do numerically. And this is there in theorem. Uh, I, I mentioned the theorem with Albert and uh, Gergana and Shemek, theorem three here that says, Look, if you want a stable numerical method, you'll never do better than the entropy. There it is, theorem three here on this slide. Am I still alive on the slide? Yeah. Yes, 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 okay. yes, you are. So, so this says entropy is somehow controlling you. Now, let, let me just say, because I know time is running out. What, I, yeah. what do I think is happening in neural net? I think they say, well, look, we'll compute like hell. We'll, we'll put this thing in, we'll compute forever. <laughs> okay, if you compute forever, then, then of course, the instability doesn't hurt you. Stability really means, can you do something within a fixed budget? Numerically, you know, you say you have a system of linear equations to fall, solve, right? And we say, well, you have a, 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 a uh, your, your uh, what, what do we call it? condition number of the matrix. If it's huge, we, we can't do it. What does it mean? No, you could do it. If you if you spend forever, you'll do it, right? <laughs> it's not, not a question, can you do it? You can do it, but it's a, it's a budget of time that it takes you. So I think where neural nets, part of the reason why they're, they're, they're winning, they're a good system to represent and approximate. I don't disagree with that. 
but part of the reason they're winning is computational. You know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Andrew talked about model reduction, the same thing. We see in model reduction, if you're allowed, if you allow me a lot of time offline, offline to do my work, I, I can take a year and I'll come up with something great. <laughs> uh, I can learn a function f. Yeah, sure, you can learn it, but how long did it take you? You know, we got five seconds. Oh, Just sorry to. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, I think we got to. Uh, if you can uh, unshare your screen so that Greg can step in. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for your screen. The next speaker.